have the knowledge so that we may act upon this knowledge, incorporate that into our lives, so that we may be able to redeem ourselves. Through our Mother, Father, Creator, we say, Ashe. 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 Say something to them on the drum real quick. One quick minute. Just let them know we now ready to rock and roll. help us to remember that we are the sum total of all that has gone before us. You need to look at it again. I'll do it real quick. We're looking at a chair. The chair is made out of metal and it has handles made out of plastic. The drum has wood made out of trees that grew up out of the ground. We've got floors that's made out of stone or sand put together with some kind of cementing element. But all of it comes from the earth. The plastic comes from dead, rotted bodies and plants called petroleum. The iron comes from the compressing of the same things that once lived that is dead, compressed by the pressure of the earth into what we call iron. There is nothing in this room that isn't a recycling of something that once lived. You understand? Your ancestors are all over you. Everything in here has an aspect or an element of it. You can't think without it. The perspiration of your mother so long ago is still a part of you. We don't see it like that. This culture don't let us do that. Don't let us remember like that. Remember I told you, remember means to bring together all of the parts as it once was. Your spiritual parts, your social parts, your physical parts, so that you can see yourself as being one. We'll go back over real quick. I wanted to show this just so you can get it, sort of like getting a picture. This is Nefertiti. Not the one you see in the book, that little white one that the Germans got in the museum. That's smaller than this microphone head. This is the picture of Nefertiti. Most of the pictures, hundreds of which exist in Africa and Egypt, look like this one, the black woman. And she wasn't from what we consider to be Egypt. She was from what is now, you might consider, northern Lebanon. That area used to be called Mitanni, but it was populated by black people. Her father was at war with Akhenaten's father. So Akhenaten, the Egyptians, won the little battle. So the king of Mitanni sent his daughter to marry the king of Egypt, which was the most pre prestigious thing in the world. But the father died before she got there, so the mother had her marry the son, Akhenaten. And this was the mother of Akhenaten, Queen Tai, or Queen T. Clearly as that Nefertiti is, an African woman. And she had the African princess from Mitanni marry the African prince from Egypt. And this is the African prince from Egypt, Pharaoh Akhenaten, who married Nefertiti, and who was the son of Queen Tut. And this is the father of King Tut. They play a whole game with that piece. They say, well, we don't know whether it's the son, the father, the son. This is King Tut's father, OK? And when he was born, his name was not King Tutankhamun. His name was Tutankhamun. 
and his name was changed to Tut an Amon because Aton was how they designated the deity in the consciousness. So this is the brother. That's his mama. And that's his wife. Now that's the royal house in ancient Egypt in the 18th dynasty under Akhenaten and Nefertiti and his mother, Queen Tai. Because there are those who dispute if the people are black. Well, you see their photograph, they left it in paintings, they were black. And this one is of the wife of Ramses, the great Ramses. This is Nefertari. As that name Nefertiti means very beautiful, this name means most beautiful. And as you can see, Nefertari had, in her time, red paint, white paint, and black paint. But she painted her skin black, not white. She had white paint. So if she thought she was black, she could have painted herself white. Right? So we don't need somebody today to tell us what the Egyptians were. The Egyptians have told us and left for us who they were. And this, of course, is the picture of the great Sphinx of Giza. Now, is there any confusion of what race this is? This is a side view. All of these photographs were taken by Dr. Asa Hilliard back in 1987. And this one, we've got what people are calling dreadlocks, but that's not dreadlocks, that's sacred locks. Dread is a British word that means fear. Okay? So we're all over Africa, all the pharaohs wore their hair locked. That's why they wore the cloth when they went public to keep it clean. All pharaohs were priests. All priests in all African cultures locked their hair. It was a reference back to ancestors and a time when we didn't have a comb or a brush and our hair just naturally locked. So that's what the reference back to was. So to become a man in the um, community of the, the East African Maasai, you must lock your hair. They use the red clay to make it cling, but they're allowing it to naturally lock. To become a priest in Ghana, if you train at Latte or Kamasi, you take three years in the training process and you lock your hair. When the three years is up, you can cut your locks if you wish, or you continue to wear them. The same thing in Botswana and in South Africa. You, to be a priest or priestess, you lock your hair. The same thing in Nigeria. You may, and in, in Benin, you may choose to cut it at the end of the three years if you wish. But the locking of the hair is a very sacred phenomena that referenced the most ancient ancestors at the time when we had not yet invented a comb or brush, and our hair just naturally, you know, locked itself and matted itself. So that is what that reference back to that sacred period in time. And so this is 1843 BC, and this is Brother Amen Ament. Is there any doubt whether this pharaoh is an African with locks? But if you, don't, if you think that's beautiful, watch a frontal view, even though they've broken the brother's nose off. Is that clearly an African, as Agnatinus, who was pharaoh of ancient Egypt? So all the joke, they're confusing themselves, they don't know who the Egyptians were. No, they're saying, we don't want to accept who the Egyptians were, but we know who the Egyptians were. We are they. Closer than you think. Again, this is the pharaoh. In 2010 BC, they had white paint and black paint and red paint. He didn't paint his skin red like they make, like they make reference to. He didn't paint his skin white. He painted his skin black, his garments white, and his crown red. He knew more about how he looked than we do. And we must accept the information he's passed down through time. Okay? That's King Mentahotep, the second in the 11th dynasty. And of course, we know that in order to build this, you must have arrived at Pi to build it on the scale it was built on. And if you read the papyrus of that they now call the Mosque or the Rhine Mathematic Papyrus, you'll see that they had already arrived at Pi by the time they built this as a mathematical formula. 
in the Rhine Mathematic Papyrus, the original of which has been stolen and sits in the British Museum, and you can go and see it. They had already put together the formula that we call the Pythagorean Theorem, except this was 2,000 years before Pythagoras that the Rhine Mathematic Papyrus was done. We know that this is called in Washington the Washington Masonic Monument. But we know that this is an African monument that's dedicated to the manhood, to fatherhood. And in, in our mythology, it is said that the woman used this to symbolize fatherhood. Because in the story, the metaphor of Osiris, the, they cut off his penis and the catfish ate it. So instead of having 14 pieces, there was only 13 pieces. So the number 13 don't come from them in Good Friday. The number 13 came from this time when it was connoted by us as being good luck, they connoted as being bad luck. But to restore the regenerative process of the male and the continu continuity of the race, the women created a penis that could not be destroyed for perpetuity, emanating out of the earth itself, the tekanu which represent fatherhood, and that's why it's the symbol of George Washington, the father of this nation. They know what they were doing. And then there's the Great Pillar Temple. This is older than the Parthenon. This is older than anything in, when Greece and Rome were still living in straw huts when this was built. So when you look at the Great Pillar Temples in Philadelphia and Washington and government buildings, you're not looking at Greco-Roman architecture. You're looking at African architecture. The great pillar temples of the Nile Valley proceed by hundreds and hundreds and not, not thousands of years any pillar temple in Rome or Greece. And to go again into our great Nile Valley civilization, taken from a little reading from um, the book of the coming forth by, no, I'm not going to do that one, um, but looking at the Hosea, the book of Ptahotep, because it makes the point of God real clear. Now, the book of Ptahotep is considered to be the oldest textbook in the world, older than any of the other literature as an instrument of instruction. So you're talking about thousands of years before the Bible and the Torah and the Koran, who say they're the monotheists, right? Now, listen to this. Be not arrogant because of your knowledge. Take counsel with the ignorant as well as with the wise. For the limits of knowledge in any field have never been set, and no one has ever reached them. Wisdom is rarer than emeralds, and yet it is found among the women who gather at the grindstone. If you are a leader and command many, strive for excellence in all you do so that no fault can be found in your character. For ma'at, the way of truth, justice, and righteousness is great. Its value is lasting and has remained unequal and unchanged since the time of its creator. It lies as a plain path before even the ignorant, and those who violate its laws are punished. Although wickedness may gain wealth, wrongdoing has never brought its wares to a safe port. In the end, it is ma'at the way of truth, justice, and righteousness that endures and enables the upright to say, it is the legacy of my father and my mother. In this passage, we're talking about the one God. In this passage, we're talking about justice. In this passage, we're talking about balance and harmony. In this passage, we're talking about the destruction of ego. In this passage, we're talking about a whole bunch of stuff that makes up the foundation of Western literature and yet, this document is thousands of years older than any Western literature. And so, we need to really reference back. We know that in 10,000 to 6,000 BC, we had created the stellar calendar. Those black people I just showed you had created the stellar calendar. By 4,000 BC, we had created the solar calendar. By 3,760, we had written our first creation story in the pyramid text. By 3,100 to 4,100, we had begun a dynastic period under the Nubian name Aha, or Narma, or Menes. And what we know as modern Egypt came into being. And so it is important that we reference back. The netters, 
which are the qualities and attributes of God as advanced by the ancient Kemetan people. Men equals lightning. Hathor, which is the head of the cow, represent motherhood. Neth, who represent arrows as the hunter, or that one which can pursue and track the character of the human being by the actions you leave behind. Osiris equals a Romula in the Yoruba system and represents the notion of regeneration and resurrection as well as Olokun, which is the bottom of the ocean. There's a point in which the sunlight penetrates water and at the point that is called photosynthesis. But the point at which the sunlight cannot penetrate, that's the point the African call Olokun. Out of that comes the plat planktons and the amino acids and the other things that when struck by sunlight produces life as we know it. So our people understood very high science. So Yimaya is that part of the water that is penetrated by sunlight and Olokun is that part which sunlight cannot penetrate. So when we think of Pata, we think about the celestial fire. Hapu, we think of the celestial waters. And those are the netters of ancient Egypt. The three major principles in ancient Egypt, the Ankh, the Wasp, and the Jed. The Ankh represent life. The Wasp represent prosperity. And the Jed represents stability. So they weren't just names they were using. They were talking about quality and attributes of the human character. If we went to Uganda, or we went to um, um, Rwanda, Burundi, there is a concept known as Montu. And when in that language system of the Bantu language, in terms of the suffix and prefix they use for human being and for human, the person or human being is Bantu. The human is Montu. I'm going to tell you why I'm doing this in a minute, right? For place is Kentu. For thing is Bentu. For being or state of being is Kentu. The suffix ba would be meaningless which represents person, right out of the Egyptian person, would be meaningless without into. Into is the essence of God, and it runs through all things as the perfect place. You say, ki, kin to. But the ki cannot stand. It's, it has no meaning in the language by itself. Only when you add the, suff, the perfect, which is God, into, do you then have a notion of place, kin to. Thing, bin to. Be by itself has no meaning as a suffix in the language. Only when you add the prefix God into do you have a thing. It goes to show you that the entire linguistic perspective of our people involved God as the central aspect of its expression. And being can to, ka, the ka being from Egypt, we're talking about Rwanda now. The Ba, the spirit from Egypt, we're in Rwanda. When you add into, you get person and you get being. So the Meduneta is not something that some other folks had up in Egypt. This is something the people from the southern part in Central Africa took to the Nile Valley. Because the river don't run from the north to the south, the river runs from the south to the north. And before you had the technology to navigate against current, people flowed with the current to populate the areas they went into. And so we come into my beloved Ifa, Ifa Orisha. Some people refer to it as Vudun. Vudun is an African word, and the word Vudun literally connotes the God. In the Ewe language, they say Vudu Daha. It means the godly man. The word comes out of the language which is used by the Fan people of Benin, the Ewe people of Togo and Ghana, the Ga people of Accra, Plains in Ghana, and the manifestation of these communities have been manifest in New Orleans, southern Mississippi, Martinique, Montserrat, and Haiti. See, a lot of time when people want to talk about voodoo, they want to leave black Americans out. Everybody want to think, we ain't got nothing. And when they reference our hoodoo, they try to make fun of it. But we use hoodoo to connote the botanical part of our system that we manage to maintain. 
since we weren't allowed to practice overtly the religion, we then practiced what we could. We could practice the botanica or the herbal medicine, which is called root in some cases, or hoodoo in other cases. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about that system, which most people call the Yoruba, but that's not the name of the system. Yoruba is simply a people that has more than any people survived with the system intact. But Yoruba connotes the people. And the people Yoruba, I'll show you later, Yoruba is a Meruneta word that's used to describe a people who trace their history from the Nile Valley. All of these people, the Fon people of Benin, the Ewe people, the Ga people in Yoruba, all trace themselves from the Nile Valley. Okay? In their oral tradition. As I've interviewed and spoken with the priests and the priestesses in those places, they all trace their oral tradition. Some of the information you can get, you can't get unless you are an initiate. I'm initiated in the Yoruba tradition, I'm initiated in the Akan tradition, and I'm initiated in the God tradition. And I do have access, and Reverend Brown, who journeyed with me to Africa, know when I hit Africa, I'm Nana on the real side from the president of the nation down, which I think I've quite earned it, because when you done fall out and passed out and all them ceremonies when you're too old to take it. See, if I'd done this stuff when I was young, I would have been cool. But I'm trying to do this stuff when I'm in my 40s and 50s, and these are things young men do when they're in their teen years. That's why they do the initiations when they're teenagers, because it's hard work and it's a lot of pressure and stress on you. But <clears throat> the Fauna of Benin called these Vudun. The Ifa Arisha or Yoruba belief, as we like to refer to it. And I want to just tell you what the Yoruba believes. We believe there's one supreme God. We believe there's no devil. Except for the day you were born and the day you are supposed to die, there's not a single event in one's life that cannot be forecast and, if necessary, changed. We believe your spirit lives on after death and can reincarnate through blood relatives. We believe you are born with a specific path. Divination serves as a road map to your path. We believe our ancestors exit and must be honored, exist and must be honored, respected and consulted. We believe the Arisha are the forces of nature, those quality and attributes of God that manifest themselves in nature at different powers of nature. They're not gods. We never re represented these things as gods in our culture. It is people in this culture that say we worship all these different gods. We knew these were forces in nature, manifestation of the powers of God in your ecology that you can learn from, reference, and be involved with to live in harmony. You must, we believe, you must never initiate harm to another human being or to the universe which you are part of. We believe the spiritual, physical, mental, and emotional realm of our existence must all work together and be balanced. And we believe that you should do sacrifices because sacrifices guarantee success. He said, oh, well, I know they were going to get to them sacrifices of killing of those chickens. You do not get mad with McDonald's for sacrificing all that beef, and you do not get mad with Kentucky Fried, who killed chicken every day, all day long. But you get mad with one African who killed a chicken in devotion to God. Ain't that deep? See how people can make you think? If you go doing Rosh Hashanah to a Jewish synagogue, you will see the rabbi take a chicken and rub it on his head. And he will take that chicken and go to the persons who come before them. And that chicken in the synagogue during Rosh Hashanah takes the sin, not Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, takes the sin out of that person. And when they're done with that chicken, they kill it and dump it at the crossroads. That's exactly the same thing voodoo and Yoruba people do when they carry on a ceremony of cleansing using a bird, a fowl. But when the Jewish do, people do it, doing Yom Kippur is a plot as culture. When they kill 10 million lambs they raise all year to kill for that purpose, it's, it's, it's um, what's that word, kosher. And kosher is meant in this language to mean it's all right. But you kill one chicken in your ceremony and cook those chicken and serve it up as feast to the people involved in the ceremony and you done committed something, a crime. And they got some words they want to use to, to make you look like you evil. 
you bad, you doing something wrong, and white folks are supposed to come and get you. And so they tell you that you're practicing juju. Juju is a Portuguese word that means toy. Or they tell you you consulted an oracle. Oracle is a Portuguese word that means doll. See, when they saw the little statues we were making to represent spirits of our ancestors, they came up with this concept of an oracle. We weren't worshiping those. They didn't know why we were making these little statues. But they word for, or for doll is oracle. And the word for toy is juju. They said the little, because we had so many statues and things, that they were toys. So we was juju people. You know what I'm saying? And so their ignorant have come down to time now as a stamp of reality on who we really are. And that ain't the case at all. And so we need to study our system and learn it so we can restore the integrity of our system. And so I'm going to go through a little bit of this, more than a little bit, so you can see some of this system. So you can know what is Orisha. I mean, Orisha is everything, because I'm Oya's son. And so I'm getting old now. I can't flirt and primp like I used to do in the old days. But I'm still power. I know I'm power. Oya is not a person. Oya is not a thing. Oya is the realization of the power within me that is dominant. See, every Orisha in the universe is in everybody. But you have one that's more dominant than the other in your character and personality. And if you learn what it is and cultivate it, then that becomes your power. You understand? Mm -hmm. And then if you turn to your brother, your sister, your mother, your uncle, and your cousin, and they all cultivate the powers in them, instead of you coming to the table with one strength, you come with 50 powerful beings mm -hmm. prepared to struggle around what you need to struggle for. But because we have not been addressing the powers within us that our ancestors have delineated and described and put in perspective for us, our enemies have been whipping the living hell out of us and getting away with it. So we got to come down to Orishas. Orishas are aspect of God that can, that we can know. No, we cannot know, we really cannot know God in its totality. We cannot even totally know the Orisha. The Orisha are a little easier to grasp in our understanding, but only a little and never totally. God is beyond our understanding. God is every solar system, every universe, every speck, every particle, every energy, every motion in, that you can't even possibly imagine beyond anything that you can grasp. You can't know that. But what you can know is that aspect of that that affects you and that is in you, and that's what we call Orisha. But you do know the God ultimate exists, so you make deference and devotion to that. But you can interrelate with his quality and attributes that we call Orisha. They are forces of nature. As such, they exist everywhere. Are we always aware of them? No, especially when we are not in the environment where the forces is manifested. Are they constant or constrained by our awareness of them? I don't think so. Do the names that different cultures give to them affect their being? I don't think so. Are Olokun and Sedena the same? Perhaps, perhaps not. Olokun lives at the bottom of the sea and Sedena lives at the bottom of the sea. How I resolve this for myself is the, in the Orisha, I have theme with variations. The Inuit concept of sed, Sedna in one way, the Yoruba concept of Alokun in another. The Inuit people, you know, that's the Native um, American people, we call them um, Eskimo. And they have the same structure. All people except European have this knowledge of, wis of nature's wisdom. So, are Orishas only forces of nature? No, they're not. They are also forces in the human mind. Again, let me give you that again. Are the Orishas only forces of nature? No, they are not. They're also forces in the human mind. Shango is in nature, but Shango is also in your mind. Yemaya is in nature, but Yemaya is also in your mind. Okay? Olokun is in nature, but Olokun is also in your mind. The Orisha also embody values. 
They are also principles of life, yimaya, nutrients, shango, truth, abatala, ethics, oshun, connectiveness, oya, change. These are quality and attributes and principles that we work with in our everyday lives. If we go back to our culture, there's a systematic relationship between how they are organized and how they can be best used for your advantage. Some consider the Orisha laws by which we must live our lives. Oshun's law is love yourself while Shango's is use your head or your intellect. The Orisha also have reincarnated on the earth and achieved Orishahood. There are stories about the apothesis of Yamaya, Shango, Oya, Orisha, Oko, to name a few. Therefore, the Orishas are also ancestors. However, a special category of ancestors. The Orishas are all this and more. And so, as you begin to grasp this thing, Orisha, that they've made you ashamed of or scared of, we will now say, um, um, what's, what's the word um, when before the libation? We, we do say the praise word, so be it. But I say, but that's not good enough. You got to know Orisha. You don't know Orisha, but Orisha knows you. It's with you every day. It's who you are, but you don't know who you are. If you knew who you are and you manipulated and used it, your life would be completely different. You would no longer be a slave trying to cut your way through somebody else's culture and somebody else's false notion of spirituality. Ifa Arisha, African spirituality, from the Nile Valley to the world, as I was starting in the Nile Valley, religion from the Greek word re, to do over, to go back, to ligio, to bind. Ligio means to bind or to connect to. Religious tradition have always been a source of empowerment, as well as the integral thread in the fabric of the lives and experience of African people on the continent as well as throughout the diaspora. The struggle of African people, both physically and spiritually, in their resistance against the entire enslavement process cannot be separated from the fortitude they receive from their native traditions. We're going to focus on the Ifa Arisha tradition tonight. This tradition is commonly known as Yoruba, or the Yoruba religion, because the people who predominated in the practice of Ifa Arisha in West Africa are known to the world as the Yoruba people, a name according to some tradition given to them by the Hausa brothers and sisters who live in the central and northern Sudan, but other traditions claim another genesis for the name Yoruba, which is made up of two distinct words, Yo and Ruba. Yo is a modified form of the word Ye, spelled Yi, and the word ruba comes from rapa. According to the rule one in linguistics, a vowel must be inserted between two consonants coming together. Hence the vowel u, or sometimes i, is inserted between r and p. According to the rule 11, p becomes b. This rpa, or rapa, becomes ruba. Now the word Rapa was the name of the hereditary prince of the gods by which Seb, which is one of the major gods of Egypt, was known in ancient Egypt during the feudal period of Egypt before there was a pharaoh who ruled over the whole land. Seb was still carried on as a deity in dynastic Egypt, but the word Seb is where the word Yoruba comes from meaning this is one of the oldest deities before Ra as an explanation of the powers of the universe was brought forth. And that word is the word that the people use to describe themselves that we know as Yoruba, who trace their genesis from the Nile Valley. The word Yoruba therefore means the living rapper. That is the true interpretation of the word as supported by similar instances in other West African languages to which reference will be made later. To look at other connections with ancient Egypt, we will read from, I wanted to read this chapter from this brother, um, um, Religion of the Yorubas, and I brought, I went to his nephew and brought the whole book, but it's not for sale. But it could be if one day we decide to do it, to do this book again, and it's by Lucas. It is an extraordinary piece of literature on the history of the Yoruba people because he proves using language even before Shekhan Tadiyab that these people and the people of the Nile Valley 
speak the same language, about 80%. Most of West African language systems contain at least 50% of the, the, the language structure and words of Medunetje of ancient Egypt. With the people in North America and parts of the Caribbean, many of you, we've been told we are brown and we are light like this because we um, got mixed with the white folks or with the Native Americans. There was some miscegenation with white folks and there was some with Native Americans. But the last group of enslaved peoples to come out of Africa were the people captured by the British. They represent the last major migration or forced migration out of the Nile Valley with the Turkish and the Serbian invasion of Egypt pushing the last remnants of us out. We were the last migrants back into Central and Western Sudan. Forcing to sell somebody, you do not sell your most immediate family, you sell the stranger, the last one to migrate into your area. Much of the population, especially in North America, are the remnants of the ancient Egyptian empire who were those last ones driven out by the invasion of the Turks, the Eastern Europeans, and, and the Arabs. And you have not been allowed to look at that. But even if you read the speech of David Walker, he makes reference to it. So they still remembered at the time David Walker in what, 1834, he was making his appeal? And it's very interesting. Sometimes we need to go back and read it. A man that you have been made to disdain, you made to hate, you were made to be ashamed of, which was one of the greatest leaders we ever produced. I happen to think he was greater than Malcolm or Dr. King as Booker Teleferia Washington. But because the enemy of black folks, the Jews, wanted to project some other folks because they wanted to take over the leadership of the black community, they denigrated Booker Teleferia Washington, then assassinated him, but because they denigrated him and gave you another hero, you weren't looking when they assassinated him. How did Booker Washington die? Can anybody in here tell me? And where did he die? He died on a train going back from St. Luke's Hospital where he had spent months in New York back to Tuskegee. Died before he got to Tuskegee. Supposedly they said in the history from gout, but he got sick sitting at a meeting with W. Du Bois and some other white folks trying to bring a truce between himself, Du Bois, and T. Thomas Fortune so they could come together in unity. And I contend that he fell sick because they poisoned him at that meeting. He never gained his health. He went into St. Luke's Hospital, got progressively worse, and said, if I've got to die, let me go to my beloved Tuskegee. His wife and them came and got him. He died on the train to Tuskegee. He was in his 40s. So we need to study our history. But they've took him Booker Washington from you, yet everything the nationalists and the Pan-Africanists say they want, Booker Washington told us then we should have done. On one eye, politically, we laugh at him, reject him, and on the other, we're doing exactly what Booker says, but we won't give him the credit, he won't proclaim him. He said, seize the land. He said, learn technology. He says, use your own science. He says, stay out of the other man's culture and social life. Just be at par with him in economics and politics. Hello, did we miss the boat? This you need to get back to culture. You need to read that Atlanta speech, and you see there's no compromise in that speech. If you read that speech, Booker attacks both the Italian and the Jews in the speech. And in the speech, Booker Washington tells him, he says, I am hung with you. I've been with your grandpa. My grandpa dad was yours on the sick bed. You know what I'm saying? He was talking about cast your buckets where you are. He told us to cast our buckets where we are. Then he tells the white southerner, cast your buckets where you are. Then he asked him, why would you, and this was the code, and this is what the Jews saw, and that's why they went after him. He said, why would you forsake me who've been hanging with you, working with you? You know me, I know you. We know we ain't enemies. We know we're going out of this thing. We can be like one in things political and things economic, and we can be like the fingers in things social. I mean, I don't want to be with your woman. Don't want to hang with you, but I want my money, and I want control of the politics. And he says, why would you forsake me for somebody, and listen to this good, whose culture and language you do not understand. Now, they couldn't have been talking about the Irish immigrants, because they spoke English. They had to be talking about the Eastern European and the Italian immigrants. They spoke Polish, German, and Italian. They were primarily Jews and Italian, and primarily at that point in time, Jews, Jewish immigrants coming to America with the same carpentry, brick masonry, plumbing, and other technical skills that we had dominated during slavery and now carried through Reconstruction. You understand? 
And so we saw ourselves being replaced by this other workforce, and Brooker was challenging them that we had a relationship that was legitimate enough, despite the background we had with each other, that should allow us to work together for our mutual good. So if you read the Atlanta speech, you'll never again call it the Atlanta Compromise, because it is no compromise. The brother was so aggressive in that speech, though much of it is clandestine, he makes you proud every time you read it. So go to the dictionary and read Booker Teleferio, Atlanta Exposition Speech, and you see there's no compromise. The brother actually didn't take no princess in that speech. Now, on the level of attributes, back to Yorba, the level of attributes and the quality of the Arisha in your character and personality. Ten steps to all action, to feel, to be hungry and thirsty for change, to look for, to seek, at all costs, search for opportunity, to find, to see and identify the opportunity and grab it. Fourth, to learn, study the opportunity. Fifth, to understand, analysis of action at hand. Six, to know, knowledge of action to be taken. Seven, to decide, deliberately choose to act. Eight, to will, to acquire the necessary power to act swiftly. Nine, to dare, to act by any means necessary. Ten, to be quiet, introspection, contemplation, and silence. These are the ten steps that was taught to me when I studied at the Zantri Voodoo Shrine at the Zantri community out of Brooklyn under Alexander Samdi, which is a very powerful voodoo uh, community in North America. And I know here in Philly you have also a very powerful voodoo community. And sometimes we get so bogged down, some of our practitioners, into the rigors of ritual and form, we frighten the people away instead of trying to explain the essence to our people. And many of the rituals and, 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 and stuff that was designed for ancient time is of no use to us now because it does not represent a frame of reference that we can relate to. You got to create new rituals using frame of reference that's apropos to your conscious understanding for you now. And then you make reference back to the ancestral forms that keeps you on track and keeps the integrity of the thing in place. You all understand what I'm saying? Okay. So let me go some more. The Yoruba, there's a primary person in the Yoruba, we call him the commander in chief, he's called Eshu, sometimes Eshu Legba. And if you went to a Yoruba person's house or someone practicing for Orisha or Santeros or Voodoo, at the door you'll see a coconut shell that look like it got a face on it or even a rock look like it's a face. That represents Eshu or Legba. Legba is the policeman, he's not really an Orisha, he's a power that communicates between the universe itself and all other living things, including the Orishas. So we call him the police of the Orishas. He's a soldier. The Orishas are really soldiers of Eshu. We say that there's seven worlds primarily. The human being, or Ini, the unborn child, or Omo, the ancestors, or Eguns, the unrun Meli, or spirits, or the essence of God, the Orisha, of which there is 401, Oluadu, Oluadu is kind of like the power that occurs when all this interaction takes place between all of the elements and the creation itself. And Oluarun, or Oludumari, which is the supreme deity itself. Oluarun is a way to say, God of heaven, or the ruler of heaven. Or Ludumari is just another way of saying the God of creation. But they're the same thing, it's just an aspect. So you see some people say, or Ludumari, or that means the God of creation, or the creator God, or Luarun means the God of heaven. But it's the same thing. It's just in the Bible, if you read, you'll see they refer to Jehovah, Ali, uh, uh, Elohim, Yahweh, Elat, etc. Those are different quality and attributes of the same force as it manifests itself. There is no good and there is no evil in our system. The female represents by Oshun is a manifestation of contraction. And the male 
Orisha, as a manifestation of expansion, represents the ability of nature to transcend its limitations. Contraction and expansion. That's how the universe works. It breathes by contracting and expanding. Everything in the universe does that. When we talk about going into the tradition, that's called tifa, or tifa, initiation. The oldest of the Orishas, according to the system, is the Batala, sometimes called the grandfather, or the spirit of the white cloth, people like to say. But a Batala is the universe as known before it subdivides into the elements we know about. It is the universe when it must have been its complete purity before it manifests itself from itself into all of the other things we know. That's Obatala. It gets trivialized where he said he's the Lord of the white cloth and people just wear white and make a few little sayings. It's deeper than that. It is a reference back to your consciousness as a baby when you popped out of that womb when you were pure, when you were the universe before you got tampered with and dissected with ideas from other people and stimulation from other people. That's Obatala. And to understand that concept is good. Of course, I mentioned Eshu, you know, and we know what we talk about in our tradition is Igun. We talk about the ancestors. Babalao is the male priest, which means the father of mystery. Mystery is the knowledge and wisdom of nature that our ancestors discern and, and use for us. I spoke to you earlier about Shango, the source of courage, the source, not just the source of courage, but the, the recognition of the courage within you to change. And of course, Ori means your intellect. They say, people always say, well, what is your Ori? What is your head? And that means your intellect. What is your conscious intellect and intellectual understanding of the forces that are you? You know, mine in excess is Oya but also I have Ogun at a very powerful station. I have Shango at a very powerful station, and I have Babaluaye at a very powerful, powerful station. As I told you earlier, I've had three clinical deaths, three dead time out of this world time. One was more than 15 minutes. I shouldn't have too much brain time after that one, but one was in, after I got back from Mecca in 74, another one was in Egypt in 87, and another was when I did my last initiation in Trinidad in 93, I think it was. And I'm talking being out of here. So for some reason, they keep sending me back. And I'm not complaining. I keep hanging in here. So we know water is omi. It's considered to be the source of physical, emotional, and spiritual cleansing. Or ya, spirit of the wind, spirit of transformation, guarding of the gateway to the realm of the ancestors. And the ones that you'll be hearing more about as you study the tradition or talk to people will be a basic seven, which seems to be the most powerful ones that we can maintain within this ecology. And that's Shango, Oya, Yemaya, Oshun, Abatala, uh, Eshu Legba, of course, um, and um, Sanyin, which is the herbal um, deity. And so you will hear about them a lot. But there are 401 of these Orishas that our ancestors knew and left us information on. And to the Ifa Orisha believer, there is 4,400 verses of Odus. Odus are the sacred verses that our ancestors left. Dr. Karanga put together this piece, which is quite worth getting. It's on Odu Ifa, the ethical teaching. And what Dr. Karanga do is compare the Medunetra are the Archon script with the Odu Ifa script and show you that the same wisdom exists throughout our system. This one, the Sacred Oracle by Afolibia Epega and Philip Newmark is also a very good one. And this deals with the verses, the chant, what was once an oral tradition is quite written down since the 20s and you could call this our holy book or whatever, but it contains the 4,400 verses and rules and regulations of how to form and carry out our character. Okay. This is another um, rendition. It's called Ifa Divination, 
communication between gods and men in West Africa by Bascom. He did, he's a European who did a lot of early research, but he's maintained a lot of integrity in the stuff. And I've spoken to many of the Baba. My teacher, um, Tawo Ogunade, who is the Baba Lao of the shrine of, of um, Oshun, has recommend this for study, as well as Numax and, and Opega and Malana's book. So it is important that you study this literature because it's there. 4,400 verses of instructions on how you should form your character as a human being left by your ancestors untampered with by white folks coming out of their old tradition is here for you to use. And so begin to use it. And Odu's is what we refer to our verses at. In our sacred scripture, this is a list of 10 and their general or basic meaning. Again, I went through this. We go through, you know, Eshu being the guardian of the crossroads, postman of the Orisha, a Bathala, the spirit of creation and light, a Ligba, the divine messenger, Yimaya, the compassionate, the nurturer, Oshun, abundant self-love, Ogun, spiritual cleanliness and transformation, Shango, awareness of the courage to change yourself, Oya, change and process, Sanyan, spirit of healing and nurturance. This should not be an unfamiliar concept for those who are into the Islam concept. In Islam, we have the pearls of faith, or the 99 names of, of Allah. How many people in there were Muslims at one point? Yeah, y'all ain't got to be scared. Y'all safe. <laughs> that, home, that home front group ain't coming after you, whatever that thing is called. The pearls of faith, or the 99 names of Allah. Example, Ar-Rahim, merciful. Al-Malik, the sovereign Lord. Al-Jabbar, the compeller. Al-Beri, the, uh, Al the evolver. Al-Haq, the truth. Al-Rauf, the compassionate. In Christianity, the 12 disciples serve the same function as the Orisha and the 99 names of Allah. Jesus represents divine wisdom. Peter represents faith in divine wisdom. Andrew represents strength and a healthy body. Matthew represents the imagination. Nathaniel represents intuition. And Mark represents willpower. And you can go on and find the rest. In Hebrew, the 12th tribe represents the same function as Orishas, 99 names of Allah and the 12 disciples. See, the Jews only got 12 fundamental powers they can manipulate, and yet they're kicking your butt, and you got 401, because you don't know yours and they know theirs. Christians got 12. The Muslims got 99. The 12 disciples, oh, no, I'm sorry, in, in the Hebrew, there's a word. I got them written in Hebrew, and I didn't translate it. I'm sorry, and I don't read Hebrew, and I have it still translated. But as it's written in Hebrew, this word means compassionate. This means merciful. This equals truth. This e at 12 means commitment. And in the ancient, these same orishas or qualities and attributes were called the Neturu in ancient Egypt. The Akans of Ghana and Ivory Coast called them Abosun. The Ga of Ghana called them Wudzi. The Ibu called them Alusi and Indimua. So all people have a way of breaking down these qualities and attributes and find that they, our people went so far as to recognize 400 plus of them in nature and in us and then came up with methodology to understand and access them so they'd be usable in developing your character, your family, and your community. And we sit around here like a bump on the log. You know, it's deep. It's deep. So we got to get back to our thing. And we know voodoo derived from the words meaning introspection and the mystery of nature. And it connotes in some of our culture God itself. Okay? In Haiti, the language they use, the Creole, which is a combination of African language, some Native American, but mostly African, using the French vocabulary, but the African grammatical framework. That's the same thing we do with Ebonics in North America. Since we weren't allowed to go to school, we couldn't learn European grammar. But we already had African grammar in our heads. So we learned European vocabulary. So when we say this and them there, that yonder, and that ain't the mind, we are using 
the, the, the double negatives or consonant, consonant, consonant because we're using African grammar but English vocabulary. And so we say things that mean things quite different or may use the same sentence or European use. We don't mean the same thing they mean with that sentence. And so we know that many of our systems have evolved and grown up over here and we have to learn more about it so that we can become more a part of it. And so when we think of the uh, Ifa Orisha beliefs, we live our life to reestablish, and this is an important part of going into the system, we live our life to reestablish the original contract with the creator, Olu Demari. It is said of every human being that we willed ourselves into being and we set our own destiny before coming. And our job here on earth is to become reacquainted with that destiny because socialization take us away from that knowledge. And so we study the wisdom of the ancestors to reacquaint ourselves with that destiny so we can fulfill the mission we gave to ourselves when we deemed ourselves to come into being. And the Yoruba tradition says that's what it does. You know, that we allow you to understand what the original contract you made with the creator was and fulfill that arrangement. Okay. Yeah, there's just a couple of other things that I wanted to get to. Um, and I think I can cover that in these two pages. If a, a tradition is given to the original creator at creation, we all know that the African woman and man is the original human creation. Let me then give you an overview of the Ifa Arisha tradition. Ifa means the wisdom of nature. Ifa believes the universe is built and governed by the dynamic force of expansion and contraction, what the ancient Egyptian called the laws of opposites. And you hear Dr. Ben talk about that all the time. The female Orisha represents the manifestation of contraction and the male Orisha as the manifestation of expansion, representing the ability of nature, as I said before, to transcend its own limitation. Ifa Orisha believes and knows, uh, Ifa Orisha believers and knows believe in one supreme being, known in the Yoruba language, of course, as Olu Damari. Ifa believes in our great prophet, Oramula. You didn't know we had a prophet. We said that all of these laws was brought to us by Aramula, our great prophet. And when you see people wearing the necklace or the bracelet with the yellow and green, that symbolize that they have studied the, the system of divination and they know the way of Aramula. Aramula is considered to be a prophet that took this wisdom to all of the world, including the people of Yoruba. And he taught mankind the sacred text of Odu, the sacred Ifa oracle laws and scriptures of Olu Damari, God itself, Ifa Arisha or Yoruba believed that the creation of humankind arose in the sacred city of Ifa. In Ifa, we believe and teach that human law must be in accord with God's law. Olu Damari's laws <coughs> of nature. Nowhere is Olu Damari's law more evident than in the ecology or ecological balance we see in nature created by the divine creator, Olu Damari itself. It's important to really understand that we never saw ourselves just as Africans. We never saw Ifa Arisha as something for African as an African religion. We saw this as the law and the rules of the universe itself. And we saw ourselves as keepers of the universe for creation itself. What are the Arishas? We went over them. The Arishas, of course, are aspects of Ola Demari that we can know. Um, we can know God, Ola Demari. No, we can't know God, Ola Demari, but we can know his forces. And I've already gone over all of those forces for you. What is important to understand about us here in America? How do we use all of this? How do we make all of this real? How do we begin to deal with what our political needs are? And I want to go back to that. What our economic needs are, what our cultural needs are, what our spiritual needs are. We won't know these things unless we return to our history and understand what is our spiritual guidance and centering is. And it will tell us what those needs are. And then we have to make sure that we are clear that we are talking about providing food, clothing, shelter, safety, and security for ourselves and our people. And to provide food, clothing, shelter, safety, and security, we must control economics, politics, and culture. To control economics, politics, and culture, 
you must be instructed and informed by your ancestors, and that means you must be into this tradition that I'm talking about. And in the end, we must make sure that we talk about the building blocks for the race, and we must talk about self and construction and configuration of self, family, construction and configuration of family, community or neighborhood, construction and configuration of community or neighborhood, race, a reconstruction and configuration of the race and nation, construction of our nation. And if we get clear on that, by dealing with substance, management, and ethics, by understanding sociology, psychology, and ecology, ecology being economic, sociology being law, psychology being culture. And using Ifa Arisha to bond us together with a methodology and with rules and regulations that help us to navigate through all these things, we will soon find that our generations will know freedom. And when they give birth to us again, we will be in the world that we created in the beginning mm. and not in the world that had been violated by a mutation of the creation. I am tired now. I have to thank you very much. I thank you. you get a lot out of there was something I had because I know there's always youngsters here and I don't want to miss this oh god my back is so tired for the young people I want to just show you that our ancestors like the young brother in the back this is how our ancient people saw God that's God with the big plumes on his head they saw God as black and that's how they saw themselves that's the Pharaoh this is from their tomb but look on top of God's head and you see where the Jews got the, the shape for the 10th tenth, the, 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 the tenth Commandment tablets from. It's the crown of a moon. But deeper than that, here is Osiris, dressed in the caress, meaning wrapped as you would be when you're buried, and the falcon sitting on the shoulder. That's where they get the notion of Jesus arising from the tomb with the dove on his shoulder. And here again in ancient Egypt is the Madonna and child. Thousands of years before Mary, we were digging now with this along the Nile. And in the Madonna and Child along the Nile, we're not talking about a special woman. All mothers is the Holy Mother. All pregnancy is a, a miracle, and all birth is immaculate. Yes. That's the message we were given. Those nuts didn't understand, thought we were talking about a special one woman. No, every woman in here is the mother of God. Every time you give birth to a life, you give birth to the potential that can manifest the deity. And that's what our ancestors were saying. And this, this one, I always like this. This is King Tut, how he had himself painted, black as midnight. This one stands in the Cairo Museum. As soon as you walk in the door to the right there. And this one is just so beautiful. This is King Tut, chiseled in gold. And yet he chiseled himself as a black young man in gold. This is King Tut, had himself chiseled in gold as a young boy. He chiseled himself as a black boy. We don't need no more proof. Our ancestors left us the proof. And this is the picture that a friend of mine, a professor at City College, took of one of our students and her baby so that any time in time we can symbolize the Madonna and child because all black woman is the Madonna and all child represent the new dispensation and the new possibility by being the son of God or the daughter of God. When you come into being, you come into being with all of the perfection that the creation has. And it is for us to make sure it's sustained in you. Thank you very much.